Станция. Доброго дня. Thank you for joining us. My name is Larissa Hedek. I'm the director of the Ukrainian Resource and Development Center at McEwen University. I am here today with my friend and colleague, Marina Chernyavska of the Cool Folklore Center at the University of Alberta. We continue our conversations of the indigenous Ukrainian relationship building initiative. Many of you know that it is a joint long-term project of the Cool Folklore Center and UIDC. Today is the second event of our land series. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather in Treaty 6 territory is the traditional gathering space for many indigenous people. We honor and respect the history, languages, ceremonies, and culture of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit who call this territory home. The First People's connection to the land teaches us about our inherent responsibility to protect and respect Mother Earth. With this acknowledgement, we honor the ancestors and children who have been buried here, missing and murdered indigenous women and men, and the process of ongoing collective healing for all human beings. We are reminded that we are all treaty people and of the responsibility we have to one another. As always, we encourage you to approach this conversation with kindness, compassion, open mind and dignity. And I'm turning over to Marina. Thank you, Larissa. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator for today's event, Dr. Lindy Ledohovsky. Lindy Ludovsky is a Canadian cultural arts and education expert. Her doctoral work focuses on 60 years of English language Ukrainian Canadian literature, the field in which she publishes as a peer reviewed scholar. The edited collection Unbound Ukrainian Canadian Writing Home that she co edited won the nationwide Kobzar Award in 2018. She served eight years on the board of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and now serves on the board of the Shevchenko Foundation. Over to you, Lindy. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I offer uh, uh, my own warm welcome to this second session of the series, looking specifically at the Canadian prairies and the presence of Ukrainian settlers and indigenous First Nations across the land. Anin, I give my land acknowledgement as I'm joining from Ottawa that sits on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. And I myself was born and raised in Winnipeg on Treaty 1 territory, the homeland of the Métis people. I will begin tonight with a quotation from prairie poet Andrew Sutnatsky, his Wood Mountain poems first published in 1976 and then reissued 30 years later, both featuring Chief Sitting Bull on the covers, if you can see. These poems are interesting, complex, and in some ways troubling with their appropriation of voice and culture and outmoded terminology. But in the book, in the collection, Sutnatsky expresses one idea that we're here with our distinguished, distinguished speakers, Chelsea Vowell and Myrna Kostash to discuss. He writes that the poems are his desire to try to find the meaning of home and to address what he calls, quote, a vaguely divided guilt. Guilt for what happened to the Indian, his language, not mine, his land taken, imprisoned on his reserve, and guilt because to feel this guilt is a betrayal of what you ethnically are, the son of a homesteader and his wife who must be rightfully honored in one's mythology, end quote. In my own writing about Ukrainian Canadian literature of the prairies, I write that because Cold War Ukraine was a closed locale, one difficult, if not impossible, to visit during much of the 20th century, contemporary Ukrainian Canadian writers began to take their images of Ukraine's culture, history, language, literature, and politics, and write them on the Canadian prairie as a substitute for Ukraine itself. And in a later article, I close with a thought that applies to us here tonight. Quote, the question of one's own belonging cannot be answered in isolation from the belonging of First Nations and the hard 
and awkward work of addressing this uncomfortable duality that is best served through real engagement with First Nations outside of the pages of the book. And so here we are tonight, outside of the pages of a book, albeit behind the screens of our computers, but we are having these important conversations. And I'm really excited to introduce to you tonight our speakers. We'll go in order. Chelsea Vowell is Métis from Lac St. Anne, Alberta, residing in Edmonton. Mother to six girls, she has a B.Ed., L.L.B., and M.A. She's a Cree language instructor at the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta. She will present on some of the social and legislative forces that impacted Indigenous peoples and Ukrainian settlers on the Canadian prairie with a specific focus on land-based practices and relationships. And after Chelsea, we'll hear from Myrna Kostash, who is an acclaimed writer of literary and creative nonfiction. She makes her home in Edmonton when she is not, traveling in pursuit of her very literary interests and passions. And she will speak about her own family's personal experiences as Ukrainian immigrants to the Canadian landscape and her own subject position as a third generation Canadian of Ukrainian descent from the Canadian prairie. After which we will have an opportunity for questions, should there be any, um, and I will uh, take my own questions and moderate the discussion. And so without further ado, I pass it over very happily and willingly to you, Chelsea. Hi, hi. Uh it's nice to um, not see everybody. It's always weird doing this because we're just sort of speaking into the ether and hoping uh, that people are out there, which I, I do. I see some uh, people talking in the chat. So it's nice that we're not just in a room with the echoes. <laughs> so uh, in the last installation of this series, we had an opportunity to listen to people talk about land-based practices uh, before settlers came, basically. Uh, so we, we looked at land-based practices in Ukraine uh, prior to uh, settlement here and land-based practices on the prairies specifically among First Nations and Métis peoples. So today we're sort of extending that a little bit further. We're, we're going into the past, but we're looking at that time after settlement. Um, and for, for the prairies, that, that, uh, that history is fairly recent. And also we want to think about how what has happened in the past impacts us today. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a presentation about the ways in which um, basically legislation was used, social policies, government policies were used differently towards First Nations, Métis, and then settlers, and what the outcomes of that are, and what, what we can see some of this today, um, you know, still. All right, I'm just gonna turn off the chat there because that's so distracting and, okay. So here's my, here's my screen. All right. Uh, so I, I'm titling this in Cree, Otagosik Nina uh, So that's yesterday and today, and then Kimama We, Wiganao, Uma Skik. So that means all of us live on, on this land in these territories. And so that that's that's a fact that we need to start with um, because it, it does mean that we are in a relationship with one another. It, it may not be the best relationship yet. It may not be the relationship that we want it to be yet. However, it's a fact and it's, you know, acknowledging that actually is a really important step because the the unfortunate truth of it is, is that many non-Indigenous peoples live in communities very close to First Nations and Métis communities, but have almost no interaction in those communities. First Nations people, Métis people come into the cities, come into the towns and interact that way, but it's, a, it's sort of a one-way flow. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding and lack of knowledge about the ways that we live side by side. All right, so let's start with the historical background, and I am making this specific to the prairies. I think it's a really important thing to do to be geographically specific. So here I'm mostly talking about um, the Albertan context, but this also extends into Saskatchewan and Manitoba in some parts. All right, so the first thing to understand is that farming obviously uh, did not start with settle settlers. Okay, um, I say obviously, but it's actually something that is surprising for a lot of folks. So, you know, many people acknowledge that certain foods were cultivated in, you know, what's now called the Americas before contact with Europeans, staples like potatoes, corn, tomatoes, tobacco, things like that. Those revolutionized what you folks call the old world. Um, and sometimes Canadians are taught about settled peoples like the Haudenosaunee who grew corn uh, in plots that would be familiar to peoples today. But that's kind of it, that there's the idea that everybody else that wasn't 
was, you know, didn't have that kind of settlement. They were just roaming around and eating nothing but meat and berries. So that's not the case. Um, so Indigenous peoples did cultivate foods throughout our territories, including on the prairies. Wilderness is a myth. The idea that Indigenous peoples didn't interact with their surroundings and, and fundamentally alter them um, is, is simply untrue. So that, that notion is something we have to challenge right away. It's also very, very important to think about how private property and hierarchies of access impacts what farming looks like today. So one of the things that we did learn in the last session, if you weren't here, was a, the hierarchi hierarchical nature of access to farming and other food, food resources uh, in Ukraine, but also throughout Europe. And there were some differences in Ukraine versus other, Europe, you know, other places in Europe, but the fact is, is that those hierarchies followed settlers over. And when I was listening to that, I thought it was so strange because uh, prairie nations didn't have those kinds of hierarchies. There wasn't, there weren't people who were sort of on top who had more access and could deny access to other people to the extent that they were starving, right? That, that, that's unthinkable. The idea that anybody could be um, homeless and hungry on our territory is just something that doesn't make any sense. So one of the things that we have to think about is it, people were not just foraging. Uh, beans, corn, squash were being grown even on the prairies uh, in the 1400s, along with sunflowers. Uh, you know, plants were, were not uprooted and put into garden plots in the way that um, maybe the European model would be recognized. Instead, they were left where they grew best. Mint, raspberry by the shores, um, wapato bulbs in lakes. So those are nice starchy tubers that you can slice up and fry up like uh, potatoes. Um, berries of all kinds, but human intervention allowed these crops to flourish and to continue to grow sustainably. So you didn't take too much because you, you made sure there was a crop for the next year. And of course, everybody wants to know if they can get your notes afterwards. So. Absolutely. I will, I will put these, yeah, I, I will, uh, I'll figure out how to share these. I can probably just do that on the website. So yeah, you can, you can have my notes. Absolutely. Cool. So we used uh, controlled burning, irrigation, um, and on the prairies, we had a, a particularly interesting relationship with the beavers because beavers also, the way that they uh, build their dams and everything helps stop wildfires from going out of control. And they create uh, pockets of fresh water that, were, that are very, very important to access for Indigenous peoples. So think of it this way. It's not just humans are altering the landscape in order to provide more bounty and more food. The animals do this as well, and, and we like to honor that. All right. So that's, that's going back a little bit back into, into further history. But let's look now around the time of treaty making. So here we're talking about European settlement um, in, in, in this territory as well. And uh, we're all together now. Okay, so treaties on the prairies were being signed between 1871 and 1908. So obviously, uh, well, hopefully you know that in this area, most of the nations were very reliant on buffalo. Um, so when the buffalo were gone and forcibly exterminated, this was a deliberate act, and fur-bearing animals were in sharp decline, um, signatories to the treaties were specifically asking for help to shift to another way to feed their people. So you know, they were looking towards um, greater emphasis on farming because that, that had to be the shift that was being made. So Treaty 6 specifically here in Alberta, so we're covered by uh, three different treaty areas in Alberta, and we'll talk about the adhesions and things like that, but you can see that the treaty areas don't don't adhere to the provincial borders they sort of overlap them okay um so people were looking for different ways to feed their people and treaty six had specific provisions um to provide farming implements and training that was a big part too they had to they wanted people to come and train them and this was to encourage first nations to replace the buffalo with another food source uh uniquely treaty six also has a medicine chest clause which is interesting to think about in a time of pandemic as it was at the time as well. Pandemics are not new to indigenous people. So the idea that healthcare would be provided freely to the people, particularly in times of, of catastrophe of pandemics was very important. People were thinking ahead of that. So what, what kind of things were they asking for in the treaties? Again, it was quite specific. You can read this in, in the Treaty 6 document itself. So we're talking about four hoes per family, two spades, one plow for every three families. Uh, harrow, sides, whetstones, sort of everything that you would need at that, at that time to, to engage in, in farming, sort of larger scale. And then for every band, there was supposed to be enough wheat, barley, potatoes, and oats to plant the land that they had. Uh, oxen, bulls, cows, boars, sows, all of this. Okay, So it wasn't just about planting, it was also about livestock, hand mills to process. 
Unfortunately, a lot of the promised materials never actually appeared. So people were sort of starting with, with you know, very little, either the, the seeds that they got were rotten or, or just didn't come, the training didn't, didn't happen. Um, and so that was, that was a bit, we'll say disappointing <laughs> to, be, to be very understated. Um, however, uh, at the time, you, you also have to understand that settlers themselves had basically no regulations on their farming. So First Nations, and I'm speaking specifically to the First Nation context here, I'll talk about Métis in a bit. First Nations were micromanaged officially through the Indian Act from 1876 on. And this was right after the reserves were created on the prairies. So you had you had a very big shift in um, in, in the lifestyle of people. They were the buffalo are, are mostly gone, um, and people are being shoved into to small areas, living together all year round. Um, not necessarily the places that they would have chosen. And the Indian Act comes into place and 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 dictates basically everything that a First Nations person could do. So that includes. Uh, selling what they what they grew, uh, going off of the reserve. The past system was never legislation, but it was in uh, it was enforced by the Indian agent. And the past system meant that you had to ask the Indian agent permission to leave the reservations, like a hall pass. And if you didn't have one, if you left the reserve without it, you could be arrested and imprisoned. So that was that was also the context. But settlers, including Ukrainians, um, you know. Are, could attest to the fact that these lands are very, very difficult to work. So we talk about breaking the land um, and think about, think about the words that we use around farming too. It tends to be very extractive and violent um, for a reason. Uh, the work itself is backbreaking. So even contending with poor reserve lands, uh, floods, frost, locusts, you know, everything that could go wrong, you know, in, in some communities it really did go wrong. Lack of uh, treaty materials that were promised, all of that. Still, First Nations very successfully managed to farm well into the 1880s. They work as collectives, so that makes a huge difference. Um, you know, using dry land farming techniques, whatever they needed, depending on the area that, that, that they were in. And Matt Hilterman, Hilterman last session talked a little bit about the, the state of the soil in certain areas along the prairies, that, that nice black soil that we have. And so, you know, despite the fact that it was very hard to, to get the soil ready for planting, uh, the yields were immense compared to what was possible in Europe, which, uh, and, and in Ukraine, which the soil there was so depleted after many, many generations of farming. So you, you had that benefit of basically virgin soil with chock full of nutrients and people were getting incredible yields. All right, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna bring in some of the, the major points here. I love my Muskegee walk, but I can't talk without it. Okay, so there were three major policies implemented in the 18, around the 1880s and further in. And, and basically what, is, what it was is uh, the government looked at First Nations and they were like, oh, you guys are, you guys are kind of doing too well and you're, being, you're, you're, you're doing well collectively. Let's, let's just slow that down. Why don't you learn to walk before you run? So they implemented severality, which split land up. So no farmer could own more than 160 acres. This was to encourage individualism and it deliberately undermined collective efforts. Any leftover lands, so if there weren't enough people to split up all the land, leftovers were simply uh, leased or sold to settlers. So a lot of land was lost that way. Then people were expected to engage in what was called peasant farming. And this reduced output to subsistence levels to support a single family. So instead of having a lot for yourself and then to, to sell, you just had enough to support your family. And no large scale uh, machinery was supposed to be used. And at this time, uh, First Nations were putting money together and buying farm machinery to use collectively. So that was no longer allowed. What happened to the machinery? A lot of it was sold off to settlers or leased to them. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, that pass and permit system really restricted the ability of First Nations to leave, to, to buy supplies that they needed, to go sell anything. Um, every, every single commercial transaction had to be approved by an Indian agent. And if you know anything about bureaucracy, if you've ever encountered it in your life, which we all have, we know how that's going to go. <laughs> it's not well. Then after World War I, we had the Greater Production Campaign. So lands were taken and given to settler veterans. So I'm talking about uh, lands that were now unoccupied because people had been moved on to reserve, but we're also talking about reserve lands. So Indigenous veterans themselves who went and served were denied the same. They were not given land and quite often they couldn't even return to their reserves. So they experienced what is called enfranchisement, 
So they became Canadian citizens with voting rights and all of that, and they stopped being administratively Indians. So a lot of them were not allowed to live on reserve with their families. And, uh, you know, so here you're, you, during that time, so many people were lost in the war as it was, and those returning, not being able to come back home and contribute in that way, also, you know, was, was quite a blow to the ability of uh, First Nations communities to produce anything and to support themselves. So amendments to the Indian Act were then made, uh, making it easier to take land that was not being cultivated properly. So this was under the, the, the ideas that Europeans had and, and the Canadian government had about how land should be producing. Uh, so that was scrapped in 1919. Uh, so it, was, it, it didn't last for very long. Um, and all, uh, but all of the amendments that were made and all of the land that had been removed, that stayed the same. They weren't going to backtrack on that. Once they gave the land away, they didn't go, oops, we changed our minds, let's take it back. It stayed gone. The, uh, the commissioner for the greater production um, campaign, he was allowed to spend banned monies. So he didn't, he didn't have to consult with anybody. He was, he was given control over that and to lease land on reserve to settlers. So the Soldier Settlement Board acquired over 85,000 acres of Indian reserve land in Western Canada alone for non-Indigenous soldiers set, uh, settlement in the years directly following World War I. So it was a huge land grab and a loss for First Nations. All right, so looking at the difference between Indian agents and then white farmers. So um, Indian agents controlled all of the funds. Uh, they could lease lands to white farmers unilaterally and they, they chose the terms and the amount. And they also carried out farming experiments, uh, which I'll talk about just really quick in a second. Um, white farmers benefited from cheap access to uh, First Nations land or just got it outright, and also tended to resent the successes um, and of, of their neighbors and had the political power to petition for change. So for example, a farm tractor that was purchased by Alexander First Nation, uh, which is just close to Onaway, out west of uh, Edmonton, it was turned over to a settler farmer um, that, that was leasing some of Alexander's lands. So all purchases had to be made out of pocket by individual First Nations because they couldn't spend their band funds. They were controlled by the commissioner. And a lot of First Nations, uh, people ended up as, as laborers on their own reserves to the lands that were leased out. So thinking about loss of revenue here, um, the Blackfoot lands, for example, there were 8,000 acres that were leased out. If they'd been leased for any amount of money, like we're talking about, it, it was it was like, uh, you know, for a dollar or nothing, you don't even pay anything, you you sign a lease and you get to access those lands. So if 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 they had been using, uh, you know, the amounts of money that you should have been leasing lands for at the time, it would have brought in $160,000 over four years, right, way back when, that's about $2.7 million now. And you can imagine what Blackfoot communities could have done with that money. And then I talked about farming experiments. So one of them was the File Hills Colony in Saskatchewan. Um, so you had graduates from La Brette, File Hills, and other residential schools. They were brought into farm, and this became a model farm uh, colony. So it looked really, it, on paper, it looked really good. They were like, wow, look at, look at how well they're farming. Um, however, File Hills, people there were forbidden from speaking their language. They could not practice their spirituality. Um, that was still illegal under the Indian Act. They couldn't sell what they grew. They couldn't butcher their own animals. Every aspect of life was controlled very much as it was on reserve. They still managed to outproduce their neighbors um, until the 1920s. And then there were a series of droughts and the rise of the KKK in rural Saskatchewan when settlers began signing petitions to stop providing resources to file hills. They were like, shut it down. We don't want to do this anymore. And we see that sort of thing happening throughout the prairies as white farmers were um, demanding that the government step in and prevent their, their goods from being devalued by being in competition with First Nation uh, farmers. All right, so let's talk uh, about how Métis farming was a little bit different. So we are explicitly excluded from treaty. When people talk about we're all treaty people, the, the concept of, of being in treaty, yes, I like it, but Métis were explicitly excluded. So we were not guaranteed any sort of farming support or supplies from any of the governments, um, but how, how Métis have been managed in very similar ways uh, to First Nations and in ways that have prevented successful Métis agrarianism. And it wasn't new for us either. Métis have been farming 
you know, it's one of our, it's one of our subsistence activities and it has been since we became a people. So root crops would be put in and then families would leave for the annual buffalo hunt. Sometimes they go twice a year. We relied on fishing, trapping, trade, uh, not just like with, with uh, Canada, but with other Indigenous nations as well. So we were doing all of that. Um, but after 1885, uh, the real resistance and um, sort of there was a mass uh, exodus of Métis even further west, kind of flooding into Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, basically, around that time, there were these schemes mostly generated by Father Lacombe, uh, who is an important priest in this area, to get Métis back specifically into farming, just farming. Uh, because we too were suffering the extermination of our buffalo kin, and this was this was framed as a way to alleviate poverty and render us productive citizens. Because if there's one thing that Métis get uh, called a lot in the historical record is lazy, shiftless, and uh, you know not really worth much. So we wanted to make make good citizens of us. So Métis were uh, required to clear a certain allotment of land by hand within a certain period of time. And then if you managed to do this, this uh, Herculean feat, you, you could have the land uh, because we lost a lot of it uh, through script fraud. Can't even get into that in the short time we have. But uh, this was mostly impossible. So most, most Métis ended up again landless. This happens again and again. And a lot of Métis were forced to live on crown lands as squatters. They just went and built houses there, uh, road allowance communities along this along the areas that were uh, that were set aside for roads and and train uh, train rail tracks, all of that. Uh, and this made it hard to farm successfully too, because you got to be uh, able to stay in a place for a while to to do that kind of farming. Uh, there were some Métis farming colonies in Saskatchewan and Alberta with varying levels of success, but nothing overwhelming because there were just so many ways that we were undermined. Again, one of the things was complaints from non-Indigenous neighbours who didn't like the collective form of a lot of our farming and felt that it was unfair competition. So again, you have Métis working for white farmers seasonally, planting, harvesting, picking rocks. That's a big one. A lot of, a lot of women and children um, right in my childhood were still picking rocks on people's lands, uh, busting stumps, you know, for, for almost no wages whatsoever. So in 1938, uh, Alberta passed the Métis Population Betterment Act. This is specific to Alberta, no, nowhere else has done this. Um, and Métis were granted land by the, Al Al by, by the Alberta government itself called settlements. We still have uh, those and we were encouraged to farm. So initially who could live on the settlements was based on economic destitution. You had to be poor. You had to be so poor uh, to live on what remains of the only government administrated Métis lands that exist in Canada. So farming for market was nearly impossible to do. There was no collateral for loans. And this is something First Nations also experience is that you can't put your land up as collateral to the bank because the, the First Nations bands don't own the land in fee simple the way that a settler would, okay? And at the time, the social credit government was really unwilling to provide any resources or infrastructural support for Métis uh, or for First Nations. And settlement Métis turned to producer uh, cooperatives instead. And th and this all, always seemed to bother the government. Every time Indigenous peoples work together collectively, the government's like, no, we can't have that and split it up. So this is what happened. Um, producer cooperative, cooperatives were formed in all sorts of industries and the settlements for fishing, fur, timber. But you know, after a while, the government was like, cut it out. It's not fair. All right. So all of this to say, you know, I really focused on the on the the kinds of um, obstacles and legislative frameworks in place that prevented First Nations and Métis people from being successful in farming. Had those not been in place, I think we would, we would all be uh, living in a very different world right now. White settlers, you know, it, it's not as though it was easy. It's not as though it was, um, you know, idyllic. It was, it, it was difficult, difficult work. And if, if you have any farming background whatsoever, even if you've just listened to your relatives talking about it, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. So I'm not saying that things were so much easier for non-Indigenous peoples, but those kinds of legislative and social uh, impediments simply weren't there. And so you had the ability as a non-Indigenous person to succeed in agriculture in a way that Indigenous people simply weren't allowed to. Now, this leads us into today. 
Uh, and in the rural landscape on the prairies, we're dealing with a relationship of abuse. And it goes back to that time, that hierarchical, oppressive nature where every aspect of life is controlled uh, and Indigenous peoples are assumed to be no good at farming and shouldn't even be there and et cetera, okay? So we're talking about stolen lands, a refusal of, on our part to disappear and be quiet about it. Canadian agriculture requires private property and the continuing removal of Indigenous peoples. This extractive economy needs unfettered access to sites, which then it abandons. And here we're not talking about farming so much as we're talking about gravel pits, uh, oil pipelines, you know, whatever it is that you're, you're sort of taking out of the earth, coal. Uh, so you have to be able to access that land and nobody can be saying, hey, that's our land. You go in, you get the stuff, you get out. And it's all framed as a meritocracy, as though the person who gets the most resources did so because they deserved it. And if we don't understand the context and the ways in which people were prevented from being successful, that sounds plausible. So it's really important that we understand the truth and look back to that history and see all of the different ways. And I barely touched on a tiny fraction of them. Um, all of the different ways in which First Nations communities, Métis communities, um, were essentially administered into poverty and you know, so many of the problems that we're seeing today are a result of that. So this isn't an interpersonal problem. This isn't a me and you problem. This is, a, this is not just like a situation where there's a few vocal racists and if we just get rid of them, no. This is systemic. And so systemic problems require systemic solutions. So we can take individual actions, but we have to make it a two-pronged approach minimally. We have to make those individual actions you know, and, and, and foster relationality with one another, but we also have to push for that wider systemic change. So I'm gonna stop there and just say that the situation that we find ourselves in today, when I talk about that sort of that, um, that abusive relationship, all you have to do is open up a newspaper, click on your browser, and there is a new story about an indigenous person being murdered in somewhere in rural prairie, uh, Canada because they were seen as dangerous, scary, possibly trespassing, all of the stereotypes that rural peoples have about their Indigenous neighbours who are also rural peoples um, actually end up causing and justifying an enormous amount of violence. And we're at the point right now, I think, where there's so much suspicion and so much concern about rural crime, which is a real issue. Rural crime is a serious issue. Um, and there are all sorts of solutions that we need to come up together to, to solve this. But looking at each other suspiciously and being willing to take one another's lives is where we're at. And that is certainly not the kind of future that I think any of us actually want to be living in. Nobody really wants to be living in that kind of fear. And if we want to understand how it got to this point, how is it that we can so dehumanize one another that we can murder somebody and then have the courts turn around and say that was justified and that's fine. In fact, it wasn't even murder, which we saw in, in the case of Colton Bushi and others. Um, you know, if, if we don't try to dig into how that came about and, and what history has to do with the present, then we're just going to keep replicating this violence. It's going to get worse. And this is particularly true as people, all, all people, Indigenous, non-Indigenous peoples, move more and more out of those rural areas and our communities become more fractured and less sustainable. What's going to be left then is just wide scale uh, agricultural, uh, like corporatization of agriculture and less uh, interpersonal relationships, which is what actually sustains us through the bad times. So with that, I'd like to pass it over. And uh, at the end of this, hopefully folks have some really great questions. Thank you so much, Chelsea. My God, it was sort of, you began with that, you know, we're in relationship with each other and then ended with it's the relationship of abuse. It was sort of heartbreaking. We'll, we'll save um, the questions till the end, till after Myrna has a chance to present. There is just one technical question that um, hopefully Chelsea, you can hop in and answer. And it's just in the chat and it's a question. Um, about the changes from community farming to 160 acres per family. And was this like by legislation, orders in council? Was this a policy decision? Um, do you have any sort of further details you can just pop in about that quick shift from community farming to the 160 acres per family before we hand it over in its entirety to Myrna? I'll, uh, I'll actually put that information into the into the chat because I, I would perfect. I really want to hear from Mira. So. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Chelsea. And now without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Myrna. Uh, 
I'm not in control of anything here. I'm not in control of my screen or anything. So, Marina? Aha. <laughs> there we are. Wow, Chelsea. Thank you so much for setting that context. There's going to be quite a bit of overlap, obviously, necessarily, fortuitously, actually, but I'm going to approach this, as Lindy suggested in her introduction, quite personally and in a narrative sense, coming out of the work I've just finished writing my new book, by the way, <laughs> look for it a year from now. Um, so yeah, let's just, this is my, my first, this is my debut as a presenter on Zoom. So, wow, here we go. So this last Best West had been popularized abroad internationally as empty, a wilderness, as Chelsea suggested. And of course, as a lure to would-be settlers that they would have free virgin sod waiting for the plow. And historically, this homes for millions had been, of course, the traditional territory of indigenous peoples. But now it awaited our forebears in sheepskin coats into the middle of their nowhere to make a go of it. And I wonder now when we first asked ourselves where certain places had got their names before we got here, Saskatchewan, Wasetnau, and Wetaskiwin, for example. Slide two, please. Okay, what are we doing here? Chelsea's already alluded to the resistance of 1885. And 10 days after the hanging in, in Regina of Louis Riel, the Métis leader, on November 16 in 1885, there were six Cree warriors condemned for killings at the settlement of Frog Lake in April that year, alongside two Assiniboine men who were condemned for a murder at Fort Battleford, and these were hanged together on November 27, 1885 at Fort Battleford. It was the largest mass execution, the only one, so God, thank God in Canadian history. And it was the closing act of the resistance of 1885. They were buried here, uh, not in, marked in this way. It was an unmarked grave in a shallow grave, not far from the fort. Now, with the disappearance of the Plains bison in the 1870s, as Chelsea has alerted us to, and the peoples who depended on them for food began to starve. In fact, calamity upon calamity followed. The mal malnutrition, famine, even the government rations were tainted food. TB, smallpox, the deliberate refusal of food despite treaty obligations. And not to mention, of course, the entire ravaging, ravaging of an ecology that was the literal clearing of the land with the settlement of settlers. Slide three, please. Now, if you can see on the top of that gravestone, the very first, the very first name is Wandering Spirits, and that they're the, the Cree. Uh, his Cree word. And he was war chief in the band of Plains, the Plains Cree Big Bear. And it was as a war chief that he had um, been found responsible for the killings at, at Frog Lake. But as a war chief, he was, his job was in fact to make war. And this is what he felt, was, understood himself, his people understood what he was doing. He was making war to protect his people, which is what a war chief does, but he had no chance against the armaments and the militia that had come from Eastern Canada. In, in, in many sense, I think he was a very tragic figure. When I stumbled upon this grave site while visiting the Battlefords in 2008, the TP poles were sort of sticking up above the bush. You could see them as you walked in a diagonal line down the bank towards the Battle River, just uh, west of the historic site. There were all these names to read, but what struck me forcibly was these men had been hanged a mere 15 years before my paternal grandparents arrived to Homestead near Vegreville in 1900, not so far from Frog Lake. And it was when I put those two dates together, standing there in front of that gravestone, 1885 and 1900, 
the mass hanging, the sod busting. I realized that our settler mythologies had never acknowledged that there was a history prior to our arrival on the land. The ceding of territory through treaty with Cree chiefs was never mentioned. Therefore, we were somehow entitled to ownership. Slide four, please. Okay, here are my grandparents. There's five of them. <laughs> How do you get five grandparents? Because Nikolai Maximuk, my paternal, maternal grandfather, died uh, when my mother was still very young, and his brother Andrew happened to be living in the same house up in the attic, and he married his brother's widow, and so he is how I, who I actually know as Gido. So. These two sets of grandparents, who all came from villages in Galicia, very close, you know, within a few kilometers of each other, nevertheless had vastly different experiences as newcomers to Alberta. And I could see these outcomes had been prefigured well before immigration in their very different circumstances in Galicia. And, and Professor Himka gave us quite an interesting narrative about what land tenure was like in Galicia just prior to emigration. So old man Maximuk's pitifully small farm, having been subsidized, a subdivide each generation could no longer sustain all his children. So his two sons, Nikolai and Andrew, lit out for the territory. They went straight to the coal mines of Silesia and with the wages that they were able to save, they then went on to, to Edmonton. They were virtually, along with my Babel Tolachna, also from the same village, virtually, they were unskilled, virtually illiterate, not entirely, uh, and very sympathetic as it turn, would turn out to the Soviet Union. But my paternal grandparents were well-educated, that is the Fedor, or Fred was, deeply religious, Anna was, and eventually materially very secure, thanks to their base on a homestead at Royal Park in the Ukrainian bloc settlement area east of, east of Edmonton. Slide five, please. Okay, you see the Royal Park is the circle down there where my, the Kostash is and the Zvarich is, the, actually Kostash married into the Zvarich clan, found their homestead there. Um, but an er, much earlier settlement, the initial settlements were, uh, were further west closer to Edmonton in what's now called Edna Star area. And I'll be making a reference to that. Okay, so this was basically a bunch of Zvariches and my grandfather Kostash who married into the Zvariches and they had along with Peter Zvarich, my Baba's brother who eventually wrote a memoir and much of what the personal narrative that I've been able to put together as to what that first generation that, uh, on the land was like their experience comes from his memoir. So he describes their first sight of an established Ukrainian farmstead by settlers in that Edna era area, the promised land. And this first sight produced severe cultural shock as Peter describes it. Had they really traveled thousands of miles from home only to be met by their probable future, this house that they saw was like a pigsty, the stable was a crude shelter, a second well was being dug, but there was still no water. The land itself was alkaline hard and stony and everywhere was swamped, soaked in swamps. And so Peter wrote, in the old country, this wretch had a fine home with an orchard, a half morgue, a little, a little less than a half an acre, and a beautiful productive field. And here, here in the promised land, he had become a beggar. But that, of course, was not the enduring story that was passed down to us. The enduring story was that they busily were constructing their future in Western Canada. And this carried with it these tropes of thankfulness to the government or even the queen for these free lands on which they were busting the virgin soil and building Western Canada. Slide six, please. Now, while they were still in Tulava, their, their village in Galicia, Peter Zvarich had read aloud to the family and to neighbors the 
reports that were coming from the pioneering efforts recorded by Dr. Joseph Olescu, who had visited these territories. And he'd written two pamphlets, which are widely cir circulated in Ukraine and called On Freelands and On Emigration. And Peter Zvarch describes the home, their home having become a hotbed of emigration fever. And old man Ivan Zvarich, the rich man of Tulova, was praying to, preparing to leave and was selling his land. He had about 30 acres, which put him in the top 20% of wealth in, in, the, in the Galician village. He was selling clothing. No, oh, no, sorry. Uh, he sold and he was selling his influence along with the land that he had. So the Zvarichik, Zvar, oh, excuse me, sorry, let me slow down. The Kostash Zvarichis did not arrive penniless, shoeless, or unprovisioned, which is, of course, the stereotype very often of the men in sheepskin coats. Even before starting out to their homesteads when they were still in Edmonton, Patriarch Zvarich had spent $1,000 on purchases that included two horses and wagons, a plow, three sections of a harrow, a stove, clothing, and some household items for the women, cheap cutlery and bed clothes. And this very much uh, is a, a reflection of Chelsea's point about the hierarchy of access to resources. This family arrived with lots of money. But to me, there's actually still quite a poignancy to this because in fact, they had all those things, their home, their garden, their livestock, their embroideries, their icons, they had all of that in Tulava. And now they were starting almost literally from scratch with living in a hole in the ground before they could get, get themselves settled. Slide seven, please. Well, the surveyor's line cut straight through the bush and four holes indicated the corners of the four sections. CPR had two of them, leaving two free sections, kitty corner. Now, Fed to Fred Kostash, my grandfather, claimed one quarter section, and his father-in-law, Ivan Zvarich, the other. This forest must be mine, said the old man. And the Zvarich men were very pleased with their choice of quarter sections, their homestead, with their provision of 60 wooded acres for building materials and fuel all free. A natural world that had been deemed wilderness and wild is suddenly to be put to use, made productive. Their labor is heroic if grueling. Break sod, plow it, uproot trees, excuse me, uproot trees and bush, seed, swath, stook, thrash, and off to the grain elevator company agents. They stack hay, fence the house, build corrals, a pig pen, a chicken coop. Within a remarkable short period of time, to, if you believe Peter Zvart. They buy heifers, a horse, more pigs. No longer peasants who consume all they produce, they become farmers. And the total yield from even their first year or two is more than three times the produce from their fields of Tulava. Old man Zvarich now felt like a wealthy man. A few acres of land in Galicia had been transformed into cash. In Royal Park, the cash had been turned back into land. There's a spiritual wealth here as well, however. Peter records that we, Peter and his brother-in-law Fred, felt in our hearts the eagerness of suitors about to meet their brides for the first time, he writes, and somewhat nervous, hoped that we were making the right choice, unquote. Now the nuptial metaphor here is a little startling. Unless one takes it at face value, immigrants, these young men may have been to a new world in their parlance, but the old world resided within this image of a sacramental commitment to land stewardship. Slide eight, please. Well, they are, meanwhile, back at the house, okay. So women's work on the homestead was a, a matter of course. It was just understood that this is what she would be doing. And of course was therefore severely gendered. So Baba Kostash milked the cows, fed the chickens, pounded laundry with the paddle by the, the well, 
And then meanwhile, the colonialist enterprise, and Chelsea alluded to this, I'm glad that we can continue this conversation about the garden. Okay, so the colonialist enterprise of breaking sod was here reproduced at a feminine scale in the kitchen garden. And it was always enormous, of course, and well into the second, third generation in Ukrainian Canadian towns, the, the garden was a thing of wonder. And you walk down the, the, the alleyways in a place like Two Hills and just marvel at what this garden, the Ukrainian Canadian garden, could produce. And it meant that there would always be something to eat, even in the leanest days before spring planting. So indoors, she was supervisor of the kitchen and she was feeding hired men at harvest time. And so, sometimes these were indigenous men, as well as her own large family. So a feast for the threshing crew, for example, might have her serving borscht, roast chicken, corn, new potatoes and cream, beets, preserved Saskatoons, and dried apples. And before heading out to church, occasionally, there was occasionally church, she would have already plucked a rooster, boiled cabbage and rice, washed the milk separator, sorted out socks and stockings and polished shoes with carbon black scraped off the bottom of a stove plate. By the way, it's not Peter Zwarek who provides these details. He couldn't have cared less about women's life, to tell you the truth. This is from my father's own memoir of growing up in that farmhouse. So raising the family, of course, on top of all of this, in a house built in 1913, when Baba was hardest at work, a house that had no indoor plumbing or central heating or running water, and the electricity didn't come down the municipal wire until 1930. But out on the fields, the menfolk had machines. Slide nine, please. Now we've seen a slide very much like this that Chelsea was showing, which in, in fact was Meiji farming, which was very interesting for me to, to, to learn about Chelsea. Now in 1925, the cost as large as were still breaking saw, but now they worked with a monstrous machine. Trophies of labor, trophies of labor in the machine age. And even a tractor was something to behold. My oldest cousin, still living, Oris Fochuk in Bergerville, who I had once interviewed, hoping he might still have some fraction of memory of our reach of our grandfather, Fred Kostash, was unable to recall a single thing about Jido, but he could reel off the brands, the prices, the year that he would he bought the various tractors as they as down, down through the decades. But it was actually the acquisition of a truck, according to my father, that represented the true 20th century on the land, because the, this was the triumph of metal over horse flesh. And it meant then that you could take your grain several times a day into Vegreville or Royal Park, wherever you were taking it to the elevator. It meant the roads had to be improved. And once the roads were improved, you could go further and further away from the homestead and into into town, eventually into Edmonton. Slide 10, please. Now it has to be said that Fred Kostash, to Fred Kostash, mind you, though, the homestead was merely a means to an end. And his end was that as quickly as possible to send his sons to school, urging them in his words, study boys, so you won't have to work as I do. The sons finished their public schooling in the substantial town of Regerville, where they learned to speak, this includes my father, learned to speak unaccented English, and all went on to university. It was important to Canadianize. And Peter told his sisters, all of them younger than he, if you must go to town, you will dress like ladies. We see this in this picture of a family wedding no sheepskin jackets in sight. And that's Peter, by the way, he's second from the left in the second row wearing the boutonniere. I think that's his younger brother who's the bridegroom. And those are all various relatives. This is a mere 11 years after they were they dug the hole in the ground <laughs> on their homestead. This is how they're, they're presenting themselves. So in this formula, my Kostash grandparents emigration from Tulava was a sacrifice. They were willing to leave behind material and spiritual goods for the sake of children still to be born. They had the foresight their more timorous neighbors lacked 
to see that the link to the ancestral soil had to be broken. If ever the story of future Kostashes and Zvarichs were to be written in another script. Ground Zero was the homestead, the fabled quarter section for which all subsequent benefits of education, middle class tenure, and psychological self confidence had flowed. Meanwhile, in Edmonton, things had worked out very differently for my maternal grandparents. Slide 11, please. Now in 1911, the year that my Jido Maximuk arrived in Edmonton, the largest unskilled group of male Ukrainians in Edmonton were in the category laborers. These were ditch diggers, draymen, house painters, blacksmiths, slaughterhouse workers, and Nikolai Maximuk never homesteaded. With $40 burning in his pocket what he had saved from his wages in Silesia, he bought a small house lot in what is now northeastern Edmonton, not far from the packing plants, built a small house sent from my Baba Polakna and went out and got a job in the packing plants. Seven, year, seven years later, he was dead. We think from pneumonia, but probably from the conditions on the killing floor, breathing in dried blood. Now, his brother Andrew married the widow by Baba Polachna. He never homesteaded either. He was a day laborer in Edmonton where he could get work, ditch digging, snow shoveling, laying streetcar street tracks, anything at all really. While Baba sold eggs and cream to her neighbors if they had, could afford it. She took in laundry of women whose homes she cleaned. And she also earned 10 cents an hour hoeing the garden of the Chinese neighbors who had a small market garden. During the depression, of course, they endured one humiliation after another. Eventually, Baba and Jido moved to an acreage, a market garden, in fact, just outside the city limits. And I would say that this acreage, and Jido would take the vegetables into the city market, was the closest that he ever came to being a settler in the sense that we deploy the word now, and I quote a definition the colonial usurpation of indigenous lands and the dispossession and disappearance of indigenous peoples. It never, this market garden never made Bob and Guido rich, unlike the large scale farmers out on the Ukrainian block settlement who well into the second generation and later after immigration were buying ever more land and bigger tractors. Slide 12, please. <laughs> Gido Maximiuk was a socialist, never a communist, although he passionately defended the achievements of the Soviet Union made in the name of the working class with which he passionately identified. However, there's no evidence that these anti-capitalist, these socialist groups that Gido belonged to, such as the Ukrainian Labor Farm Temple Association, or the press that he read in Ukrainian wondered about white settler privilege. Both Baba and Jira were dedicated readers of the Ukrainian Canadian socialist papers and illustrated magazines with Soviet Ukraine with illustrations, some, something like this, that I became very, um, I was fascinated by them and I would go, th go through their magazines when we, would, when we would visit them. So here we have, go east, young man. Over there where the east is red, Workers and peasants were enthusiastically constructing a new homeland in Baba's and Jiro's names. Over there, agricultural workers rejoiced in opening virgin soil of their own. But this earth, very interestingly, I guess Chelsea mentioned collectives. This earth was now owned by the collective in a land of plenty. And it's mechanized as well. You might see the row of tractors there towards the, at the back of the fields waiting to fill up with grain as well. Soviet children were going to school and the commune doled out a regular wage to its employees or members. Gido never belonged to a union because he was never an employee. So it was from Soviet propaganda that he exulted in the dignity of labor and here as it's shown on the land, virgin land in Soviet Union. Next um, slide 13, please. All right, <laughs> I'm the third generation. I'm a writer, 
and I'm in Two Hills in the summer of 1975 to do research for what will be all of Baba's children. But in September 1976, the Land Titles Office of North Alberta and Registration District certified that Myrna Ann Kostash is now the owner of an estate of the northeast quarter of Section 31 in Township 55 at Range 12, west of the 4th Meridian. In other words, a piece of land just almost exactly six miles south or north of Two Hills, containing 160 acres, more or less. I had a name for that estate, and I named it after that ancestral village of the Costashes, and I nailed a rustic board to the outside wall of the shack that was on this piece of land and inscribed it in white paint, Tu La Va, in Latin letters. To me, the name echoed the westernmost point of my forebears' journey to Canada. I was announcing that their exodus had a terminus. It came to an end, a somewhere, a here, which two generations later would symbolically terminate in the lo location I called home. Well, 45 years later, I can now appreciate what I had unknowingly done brought it to a single imagined space, the two historical sources of my identity, a homestead on Treaty 6 territory and a village in Galicia circa 1900. Last slide, please, slide 14. In September, 2012, I co-hosted an event in Edmonton. We can see it here, Zimya Nanaskoman. Chelsea, <laughs> give thanks for the land. I co-hosted it with Sharon Pasula, who's there on the right, a Métis Act community activist at the time. And we planned this ceremony exchange of gifts together, deploying our two languages as well as English. This was meant to symbolically bring back Indigenous and Ukrainian Edmontonians into some kind of relationship with each other. It wasn't an apology, it was an acknowledgement of the land that was, we were now sharing, thanks to the gift of it, ceded to us from First Nations on, on Treaty 6, through Treaty 6. Now the ceremony was constructed around an exchange of gifts, witnessed by members of both communities seated in a circle. And here you see the two dancers, they, they each gave the gift of a dance, on the left is Mark McKinnett, who in fact announced to us before he came out to do his traditional dance in his regalia, that he had just learned who his birth father was and he was Ukrainian. He thought this was wonderful, quite wonderful. And that's Vince Reese, who did a dance for us that he imagined could have been danced at a wedding in Two Hills, let's say in the 1930s. So people sang and danced, told stories, showed their paintings, exchanged prayers in Cree and Ukrainian. But the disproportionate number of Ukrainians at this event, and I would say of the 90 attendees, maybe a dozen were indigenous, led me to conclude that the ceremony was something we Ukrainians had to do more than that indigenous Edmontonians needed to do it with us. That led, led to the next several years of a lot of soul searching, a lot of studying and learning and so on. But 19 years later, thanks to what's happening here this evening, thanks to Chelsea and Lindy and to Marena and Larissa and Leah and all those who are going to be drawn into this, this initiative, um, all of you watching, I think I could say that times are changing. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Myrna, for both sharing that personal story, but also wending us through um, that bit of history. And as you say, there are many points in which um, both yours and Chelsea's presentations spoke quite well to each other. Um, we do have a number of questions popping up both in the chat and the Q&A. Um, so I'll, I'll just sort of start from sort of the top to the bottom because nobody wants to hear me talk, they want you to give the, have the opportunity to give some answers. Um, so looking at the first question that popped up, and this is for you mostly Chelsea, and it's looking at how is kinship different for Métis and Cree 
particularly in their relationships with the land, if you can speak a little bit about that. So um, in this territory, Métis and Cree, and I would say this is true also uh, very much in southern Saskatchewan, but Métis and Cree tend to be very, very close culturally. Uh, I come from a Métis community, Lac St. Anne, where people historically spoke uh, Cree. Um, may, you know, it's, uh, sometimes call it Michif, but mostly it's Cree. And you'll see up in the settlements as well in, in, uh, in Alberta that the, the Michif spoken up there is almost pure Cree with some French thrown in. And so things like Wakutuin, which is expanded kinship, it's a, it's a particular, um, it, it's actually a foundational law uh, in our cultures, is something that we share. Uh, there, you know, obviously we have we have slightly different kinship uh, systems set up, but but yeah, those are those are things that we both share. I think Métis out in uh, Manitoba also tend to to theorize around the the term Wakutuin. Um, but also tend to have sort of more relationships with um, Anishinaabe uh, peoples out there than, than Cree. So there's a bit of variation there, but here it's very, very similar, uh, our, our views towards the land. Perfect. Thank you so very much. And then uh, another question, and this one is, is for you, but, but Myrna may also be able to answer it. And this has to do with um, sort of, was there dialogue between Métis co-ops and Ukrainian co-ops. So there's this sort of very similar structure um, mm. in the same place uh, where there was there actual dialogue between the two groups. So a lot of the a lot of the co-ops, I'll just speak to what was going on in the settlements yeah. at the time. Um, Jim Brady, who was a communist uh, community organizer, uh, along with some other folks, but he, he was particularly focused on uh, cooperatives as, as a form of uh, a collective response to poverty, um, but also to liberation. And, uh, you know, he did a lot of work proselytizing communism to people in communities and things like that. But from what I understand, there wasn't much of a chance to link up with other groups who were doing collective work. And I know that Ukrainian collectives were also targeted um, by the government because they were seen as as problematic and at that point Ukrainians were not they were not really um, folded into whiteness yet they were still othered uh, and faced a lot of over discrimination as somebody pointed out uh, so kind of becoming becoming Canadian took a took a, a while longer but uh, definitely there was a lot of lip service paid by prairie governments at the time who are nominally socialist but very politically conservative about supporting collectives while they still bureaucratically made sure that it wasn't even it wasn't even deliberately but a lot of the collectives failed because of bureaucratic intervention and I'm, I'm certain that this was not something that only indigenous collectives experienced yeah yeah I don't know I, I don't know anything about this history uh, Myrna did you uh, previously know about the history of um, Métis collectives no, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, as I understand the credit union movement, for example, may be the most obvious example of a of a collective uh, that was constructed and organized by in Ukrainian Canadian communities. This was an idea that came from Galicia. This was already a very popular, well-founded movement in Galicia and was was transposed along with many other institutions with with the settlers. Um, and when I, I, for, I think the, the concern that the, that the credit union movement had at the time in Begavo, let's say, was not with any sort of competition with Métis or indigenous uh, collectives at all. I think, I think quite unaware of it, at least it was never brought up to mind. But the concern was with the capitalist model of um, commerce mm -hmm. in these mm -hmm. towns. And of course, uh, I shouldn't say of course, it happened to be in a lot of cases Jewish. And so there was a kind of tension between this the ethnic solidarity of a of a collective solidarity of the working person and the, the farmer or something and this individual merchant a jewish family in in Vergabal, for example yeah yeah that's i mean that's a that's a, a a kind of fascinating insight that you've got the <laughs> Kind of collective farming from a first nations experience which is again a kind of rejection of a eurocentric modality of land ownership and cultivation and then you similarly have a kind of eastern european and ukrainian notion of the collective emerging from a rejection of uh, a, a capitalist approach so very similar 
um, ways of engaging the land, but from kind of quite different um, political backgrounds. So I, I appreciate that insight. Um, one of the comments that Teresa had made that Chelsea, you've already mentioned is the, the kind of othering. So it wasn't a simple, you know, Ukrainian as white settler in the same way that say uh, an Anglo or, or Franco Canadian um, settler um, experienced their their sense of power within that imperial structure. And, and one of the questions that came up as well from Teresa is in looking at this sense of people coming from Central and Eastern European, often um, fleeing uh, poverty, war, oppression, serfdom, um, how does then us sort of referring to them as being part of this colonial project affect their own narrative about their own history? Do they do we think that they felt like they had the power of colonizers? And, and again, I, I think you've kind of touched on this already, but it would be great to get both of you to expand a little bit more. Yeah, I think I think it's really important to understand that settler colonialism is a relational term. So it's not it's not it's not about what you as an individual do or the kinds of things that you're escaping, what kind of wealth you may have or not have, what opportunities you have or not. Um, settler colonialism requires physical presence on the land to assert control and domination over that land. So obviously Canada had a preference for certain kinds of, of settlers at the beginning. Ukrainians were not preferred for a very long time. And when Ukrainians were here, they were considered to be um, unsuitable for, for the kind of the Canadian experiment. They, they weren't seen as, as assimilating properly. There's all sorts of fascinating documents, particularly from um, uh, the post-war period, uh, ways in which the Canadian government wanted to encourage Ukrainian uh, immigrants to change their the, the food that they ate, uh, the way that they, you know, where they worked, the kinds, and, and break up some of those collectives so that they would assimilate better. So this can be something that people can experience, whether they're uh, Irish settlers, uh, Scottish, Frank, you know, fr Francophones also kind of grapple with this as, as a people who experience colonialism. But it's also important to understand that you can occupy two, two positions at once. You can be um, oppressed and part of an oppressive system. So your presence here can be used as a way to, to sort of give legitimacy to the Canadian state, whether or not you agree to that. So it, it's something that I think people do have to think about and then think about how they can change that relationship as a whole. So it's that two-pronged approach I talked about. It's, it's really important that you think about your individual actions and your choices and your positionality, but we have to also really work towards that systemic change because you as an individual can only do, you know, makes make so much of a difference. Yeah, I think that's a really balanced and really good answer, especially kind of teasing out the kind of what we're talking about structurally when talking about settler colonial relations and then, and then of course, the individual responsibility that we all bear. I don't know, Myrna, if you wanted to add further gloss to that or. Uh, sorry, I just got to I got to address yes. this because I see this come up a lot. Yes, I, it doesn't matter if you were a meat packer, doesn't matter if you were a serf, if you were a farmer, if you were rich, whatever, <laughs> if you come to this country. And you are part of, of the way in which Canada claims the land, then you are a settler. It's not a pejorative. It's not saying that you are a bad person. It's not saying that you individually are doing bad things. You are part of a systemic uh, situation. So this, I, I know that it's, I know people want to avoid it. They want to say, well, not me. This wasn't my family. Uh, we were poor, we were, we were fleeing from something, but that is not, it's not about your personal history. It's about the relationship that you come into, that you didn't, you didn't create this relationship, but it's something you come into when you get here. And it is up to you to be aware of it and, um, and understand that system. So it's, it's, again, please don't make it personal. Don't, don't, it's, we're not here to guilt trip you, but you do have to understand the way that settler colonialism is structured and functions and continues to function on these lands and quibbling about what people are calling you is, is missing the point. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good one. Yeah. Mirna, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Chelsea. I struggled with this a lot when I was writing up the story of my maternal grandparents, the, <laughs> um, the meat packing plant worker and, and Baba with her, her hand, laundry she brought in by hand anyway. And then I realized as I put their story together that although they never settled on the land and claimed homestead title and all that, the goodies that were offered to the settlers on the land, 
when they came to Edmonton, that was already on Treaty 6 territory. It was already very much uh, a community that had, had risen from, from the uh, fur trade and in trading with Indigenous people, blah, blah, blah. Um, he bought a, a, a small city lot. Well, where, how did that land come in, into the city's um, cash, you know, that he could, that he could then, how, did, how was it possible that Canada Packers was able to build a packing plant? there and then he was able, able to extract wages from it and so on. And so that, it, 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 I realized then that there had been it, it in a kind of perhaps indirect way, um, uh, these benefits that eventually flow down to the next generation, but basically, which is also true from the, to the farmers, right? Because of education, you know, there was a welfare system or what have you that then flowed into the second and third generations. The, these were the benefits of treaty, if you put it that way, thanks to the always beginning at the beginning of this session of land. Yeah, and, and I think that's, um, so this ties into one of the next questions, um, which has to do with, again, this idea of um, how we imagine the rural space. And uh, the question sort of points out, Chelsea, that sort of at the end, you're talking about Indigenous people also being rural people. and um, we often um, don't see Indigenous, we either see them in this imagined wilderness space, which as you rightly pointed out is a, is a debunked myth, um, or we think of rural as this very pastoral, um, other kind of uh, Canadian rural space. So can you sort of talk about the rural space and, and sort of Indigenous um, images and presence in a kind of rural imaginary? Yeah, I mean, especially in Canada, uh, Indigenous peoples tend to, uh, I mean, we're also urban peoples, right? Like most, most populations, there's been a massive shift to urban yeah. centers. Yeah. Uh, most, most Indigenous peoples do live in urban centers now. But for the most part, our communities exist in rural spaces. But you're right, people don't think of it that way because there's, the, even if people don't really think about it consciously, Indigenous peoples exist in this third space, this, yeah. this sort of like unknown, it's like a, you're playing video games and it's just the fog is there and you don't really know what exists. <laughs> that's, that's our communities. And that's what I was talking about, how there's not that two-way transit. You know, um, we go into uh, non-Indigenous communities all the time, but very rarely is that reciprocated. People, you know, why, why, you know, people are afraid, people have all these ideas about it. Um, and so even though we're out there existing in rural spaces, I think people don't think of us as rural people, even though there are still folks farming out there, First Nations farming out there. Uh, TikTok if you, is a great place to go see some people highlighting some of that. Uh, you know, there are still Métis folks out there farming and whatnot. So the thing is, is that we have so much more in common in terms of our concerns about the environment, about the kinds of uh, situations that we encounter in rural spaces. I, I talked about rising crime as a real issue. Um, you know, the exodus of young people from our communities going into the cities and then basically like these huge uh, corporate con conglomerates that are taking over uh, a lot of what used to be family farming. That That is something that concerns everybody who lives in rural spaces. And instead of getting together and dealing with these things as sort of a united front, we have non-Indigenous farmers over here indigenous farmers over here and it's like they don't even you know they're they're doing two different things and it's not effective and I would love to see more rural solidarity because I think that that's really where things are going to play out that's where we're going to start addressing because that's where all the extraction happens that's where all the industry is is polluting for the benefit of of the urban south so we should be working together to kind of make sure that the decisions being made in our territories our shared territory benefit us. Yeah. Myrna, did you want to jump in? Yeah, you know, I'm wondering how many of us Ukrainian Canadians are still out there in rural Alberta. I know there's a lot of them, but there's been a very poignant example recently about Two Hills, actually. Mm -hmm. Two Hills, which was as recently as 1975, that was recent for me anyway, when I was doing my research for All About Us Children, it was a, it was a thoroughly Ukrainian Canadian town. Now it is almost exclusively Mennonite because of the uh, immigration into Alberta from Mexico of Mennonites. At least this is apparently how it's represented. The Toronto Star recently did a large article about the fact there was such low vaccination rate in, the, in Two Hills. And there wasn't a single mention made that there had been a Ukrainian 
uh, generation there earlier who had been the settlers and had founded the, the institutions of that, of that town and so on. So Chelsea, I'm just wondering, this is a lovely idea that we can all get together on the land is there, that we share those spaces. I'm just wondering how many, how many of us are still gonna be there in another generation? Well, that's, that's precisely it, you know, and that it's definitely a concern. You know, the fact that it is so difficult. I wanna go live in my territory. Lac Saint Anne is not far from Edmonton and I can't because I would have to commute every day into the city where the jobs are. And, and that's just, that's an economic situation that uh, is, is incredibly pressing for anybody living in, in, you know, rural Canada. And that's something that we need to be looking at. Like, this is, this is something that weighs on our minds, right? Um, and we share that concern. We don't want people, we don't want, our communities are where our families are. And again, I'm talking about Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples alike. It's where we have our, we practice our spirituality or our religions. It's where our you know, we raise our kids, we want to be out there. And the lack of economic opportunity means that we simply don't have that chance anymore. And that's definitely something that, uh, you know, we, again, we, we share more concerns than, than not. Yeah, and there's, and there's a couple of questions and in, in, in being mindful of time, there are a couple of questions on sort of the same topic. And it's about, are there any sort of specific um, examples about um, Ukrainian settler communities and indigenous communities in Alberta, sort of what was that interaction um, really like? And so was it, uh, as you're saying, the kind of uh, separation, you know, is there, is there other literature? Is there, is there something else that either of you can point us to, to give some, some precision about what it was like in Alberta in particular? Yeah, right off the top, I want to know who were these Indians or Indiana? <laughs> that some of the Ukrainian Canadians report having encountered or have had an exchange with or whatever. They're never specified beyond that because, you know, from the settler's point of view, these were, in fact, they were savages or whatever. And, and Ivan Zvaric was, and Peter Zvaric back in Tulava were taunted by their neighbors who were afraid to go over to, to Canada that they were going to be captured and scalped by these savages or at best have a some kind of feathers put into their hair or something. So when they finally encountered an indigenous person, my question is actually, who were they? Were they those road allows people actually, Chelsea? Because as you narrated it, the reserve people were on the reserves and were unable to leave, wander around the country because you could think for some of these anecdotes, you know, the indigenous woman who comes and shows you where the Saskatoon bushes are. These are not off a reserve. Are these, are these in fact, Métis families that our settlers are encountering? I mean, it's possible the past system, the past system uh, I, I, it sort of came out of practice in the 50s, I guess. So, um, well, I mean, depending, you know, there were still restrictions about gathering in pool halls and things like that. And, and in Edmonton, you couldn't serve drinks to, uh, to Indigenous peoples well into the 70s, but people were a bit more mobile um, after the Second World War, and it's it, but it is entirely possible that they could have been Métis. But I know that, for example, um, out at Alexis and Paul Band, that folks from there were trading. You know, they'd go, they would, they would sort of travel and trade fish and meat uh, with farmers in the area. They had long-standing relationships with farmers in the area, um, and also uh, did some of that labor work uh, intermittently throughout the different seasons. Like I said, when even when I was growing up. It was the it was the cookums and the and the kids the who were picking rocks for pennies, um, so it's it's interesting because um, one thing I have to say is that this is an area that there still needs to be a lot of uh, geographically specific research done, particularly in that post war period, because you know we have we have um, I mean before that too we have internment camps and things like that. What were the we have stories about internment camps. We have stories about the pitiful situation um, that that we saw uh, Ukrainian prisoners being in. Uh, we have terms for Ukrainians, so clearly relationships were there, and I, I, I have the sense that those relationships were somewhat mutually beneficial for a certain period of time, and then there was a distancing and a separation, and we've forgotten that history. So this is something that I would love more people to, to take the time to learn because something I've discovered being from here is that it, it's the same thing with Métis history in this area. We hear a lot about Batash and Red River, but specific history here, um, in, particularly in mid-century, 20th century, uh, there's just sort of a gap. Everybody wants to talk about the 1800s and then it's like, 
what happened after that who cares and and i think too and and i'll i'll sort of cut things off so we can be mindful of time but but one of the questions that ties this together is sort of looking at the fact that of course these categories too of the ukrainian settler or the ukrainian immigrant or the ukrainian labor and the indigenous or metis um, themselves are often also blended as people end up being of, of various kinds of mixed heritage so that those interactions that you're talking about and the sort of specificity of that research isn't always just you know about these these uh, homogeneous groups that can be neatly tied up with a bow but there's a lot of that sort of mixing I don't know if either of you want to sort of mention that mixing or just acknowledging that 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 does in fact um, play a part of the story here yeah go ahead and Oh, so no, I can't. Yeah, yeah. And here it's since since our little group started doing this kind of work, reaching out and starting build, building some kind of dialogue and who we can invite in and so on, more and more people come forward identifying themselves as having Ukrainian heritage, but uh, being raised in, in indigenous communities. Okay. I'd love to be um, informed otherwise, but it is my impression that when there is a union of an indigenous and a Ukrainian couple, that child will be raised by the indigenous community, not by the Ukrainians. I never once ran into a mixed, uh, a person of that mixed heritage, let's say in Two Hills, I never, never heard about that. We hear about Harry Stonadka, the violinist, but he was raised and was a, a member of St. Paul Saddle Lake uh, First Nation. So I'm just putting that out there Yes, there were interactions, there were lots of intermarriages, we benefited from each other, we were afraid of each other sometimes or whatever, but somehow we did not, Ukrainians never raised those children and I'd like yeah. to know why. Well, I yeah, know why. And, I, and I mean, I, I, you know, you can probably have the suspicions which yeah. are both gendered and socioeconomic in, in framing in terms of um, families and and on that though we do need to bring things to a close and luckily the sort of remaining questions are questions about so what does the future look like what is the path forward what happens next and you know and and in that I I have the um, lucky responsibility of of pointing to the next session which is coming up um, in November and I'll I'll put the information in the chat. Um, it's November 17th, and that, that upcoming session is called Our Futures on These Lands, and people can register on the same website as you did for this one. The description of the next session is what kinds of land-based practices and relationships should be reestablished from long ago? What kinds of innovative responses to colonial pressures from yesterday and today will continue to be useful into the future? What kinds of interventions can indigenous peoples and Ukrainian settlers make today that will sow the seeds for the kind of future we want our descendants to live in? And even though we didn't have the opportunity to sort of um, mention everything that was going on in the chat, that was much of the conversation. So what's the path forward? What does it look like now? They, you know, our, our ancestors may not have known things back then that we know now. Um, what do we do from this point forward? So I think um, today I'm incredibly grateful to the two of you for presenting us a bit of the history, but also obviously for sowing the seeds for that future discussion um, for the next time. So on that happy note, unless we have anything else to say, we can bring this to a close, yes, jump in, Chelsea. I, Go I for just it. have one thing. This, this uh, people brought this up. I just yeah. want to point out. I didn't say this, but my paternal grandmother uh, was Ukrainian, and I grew up without any knowledge of that. Uh, she she did her best to assimilate. Didn't teach my father the language. Uh, all I know from her is she was an amazing gardener and cook. Uh, and I didn't even realize she was Ukrainian until I was I was basically a teenager. So we we're out there. But as as Mirna pointed out, I was raised Métis with no access to my Ukrainian heritage whatsoever. So I think that these discussions are still some you know these explorations that we're having are definitely something that need to be done now um, to uncover the, the, those kinds of stories and those histories. So yeah, this was awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, everybody. And, and thank you for organizing it and for being such amazing speakers. Thank you.